السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله My recollection is that we finished at ayah number 56, but because the, the connection is there from a couple of ayahs before, I need to go back to ayah number 54, uh, ayah number, sorry, ayah number 53. So if my memory is incorrect, sorry, but... Uh, I have this recorded at my end, but the connection between the ayat requires that I go back to ayat number 53. <clears throat> so, um, ayat number 53 in surah number 39, which is surah az zumar it says, say, O oh, my servants, those who have transgressed against themselves by either committing evil deeds or sins, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Allah wants us to never give hope when it comes to his mercy. His mercy is so encompassing and readily delivered by the will of Allah SWT whenever we ask for it and whenever we act according to our faith and ask Allah for accepting our repentance he is ready to accept it so in this ayah this ayah by the way is labeled as the most full of hope ayah in the Quran the most inspirational to the worst of people. Meaning among the believers, we are all sinners. We are all wrongdoers. So Allah is calling the ones amongst us saying, oh, you who have gone so far in my disobedience, in rebellion against yourselves, and rebellion against your interests, never lose hope when it comes to the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You see how merciful Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is. This is very beautiful invitation for every Muslim to rush to make repentance, to go back and return to Allah independence and that's exactly what Allah wants us to understand and on what basis is this Allah says that Allah forgives all sins you, you see in surah number four Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah does not forgive associating partners with him but he forgives anything else in this ayah he is saying Allah forgives all sins and that includes shirk even if the person is an idol worshiper Allah is still calling the Prophet وسلم, and telling him Tell those people who have gone so far astray that they should never lose hope. Why? Allah forgives all sins. So how do we reconcile between the two ayat? It is quite simple. When Allah says that he doesn't forgive shirk, it means he does not forgive shirk or associating partners with Allah if somebody continues to commit to other gods or to associates and partners that they invent in lieu of worshipping Allah if they die doing that but if they repent 
before death and go back to Allah, Allah will forgive them. So this is the reconciliation between the two ayah. Listen now to the following ayah, ayah number 54. It says, and turn in repentance and in obedience with true faith to your Lord and submit to him before the torment comes upon you, then you will not be helped. So the condition for this type of forgiveness is that people should return in repentance to Allah and submit to him and ask him to open their heart for the truth and to accept their repentance. And Allah is ready to receive our repentance at all times. Is there a deadline? Yes, the deadline is do that, go back to Allah in submission and repentance before you lose the clock, before you die, before you are taken out of life all of a sudden, because death does not necessarily give warnings. It comes all of a sudden. So now the only condition is to return to Allah for repentance and to submit to him and ask him for forgiveness and to do that before the punishment comes and you get no helpers. What else? And number 55, it says, and follow the best of that which is sent down unto you from your Lord, which is the Quran and the guidance, the Sunnah of the Prophet Again, it says, before the torment comes upon you suddenly, while you do not perceive, you don't know where it's coming from because it comes all of a sudden. So you, we need to track those conditions that are mentioned here for Allah to accept our repentance, forgive our sins, and open the gates of mercy and shower us with his mercy. Then ayah number 56 and 57, they give us cautions. Ayah number 56, it says, Lest a person should say, meaning on the day of judgment, okay? Alas, my grief that I was undutiful to Allah. This regret in this language, in this fashion, is very hurtful, it's very painful. God forbid when somebody commits to worshiping idols or disobeying Allah until they come back to Allah by death, they will regret and regret and lament badly. And this is not gonna be help of help. So the caution here is do not wait until you meet the torment of Allah until you meet Allah, until you meet your death and you return back to him before you had repented, before you had corrected your way. So the Quran is clearly telling us, beware, you will go back to Allah definitely. Don't come back to Allah without repentance, without correcting your way. Because when you lament and regret after death, it's not gonna be helpful. The Prophet وسلم, says, there is not a single soul that dies except in regret. Every one of us will regret for something. 
So he goes on to say, those who have done bad, they would regret that they had not repented and they had not corrected their ways. Once they face the reality after death, they will know that this repentance at that moment is useless. Then he goes on to say, and those who have done good, they would regret not having done even better. When they see the reward of the little they have done and the great reward they get for it, they would say, I wish I had given $10 instead of five. I wish I had walked to that person in his home instead of inviting him to my place. I wish I had visited that sick person. I wish I had repented and paid back my debt to people. So anyone who has done good or bad will be in the state of regret. But the regret here that A number 56 is talking about is about a person who did not do good at all. He did not believe in the Quran. He, he was mocking the Quran. He was mocking at the Prophet وسلم, and his mockery will come to haunt him as soon as he crosses from this life to the next one. So he would regret having been a mocker of Islam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ayah 57, it says, or else a soul would come before Allah and it would say, if only Allah had guided me, I should indeed have been among the muttaqeen, the mindful ones who are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, it is regret. Didn't Allah guide us? Why should we not follow his guidance and wait until we see him face to face and he questions us and we have no answer? Why should we corner ourselves in a place and a time that we have no recourse to correct anything? Uh, 58, or else lest a person would come and a soul would see the torment and say, I wish I had a chance to go back and return to the world and to be among the doers of good. I wish I could go back and be righteous. So Allah answers all of those false regrets, useless regrets. And he says, nay, my signs and proofs and evidence and verses and miracles have come to you, but you denied them. And you were proud and arrogant. And you ended up joining the disbelievers. So this ayah, ayah 59, obviously and clearly tells us that those regrets after death are very useless because they are based on a person denying the revelation of Allah. And now after death, he's coming or she is coming and saying, I wish I had another chance. There is no chance after death to come back. So ayah number 60 summarizes 
all of this by saying, and on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection, you will see those who lied against Allah by joining other gods with him or by equating others with him or by inventing gods with him, whether the person worships a tree or a human being or the sun or the moon or anything else, this is all unacceptable. So in the day of judgment, you will see those who have lied on Allah by fabricating and attributing Godship to other gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see them with their faces that will turn black. Black here is not a color, but it will, it will be dark out of sorrow, out of regret and sadness, because they will face the torment of the hereafter. So you will see their faces turning dark. Then the ayah concludes by saying, isn't there in hell an abode for the arrogant ones? Definitely, this is a rhetorical question. In essence, telling us the only thing that is left there for those arrogant liars who denied Allah his lordship and worshipped others or associated others with him, they will have nothing but a fate that they will hate so much and their fate will be nothing but hellfire. On the other hand, Ayah 61 is saying, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deliver and give relief and save those who are pious and righteous ones. He will save them in their own special way into paradise. And they will not be touched by anything bad, nor shall they grieve. This is an amazing assurance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you lead a righteous, clean life, life of humility, life of obedience and submission, Allah will salvage you on the day of judgment and save you away from hellfire, which will mean that you will be sent to paradise untouched with anything harmful nor will you grief, there will be no grief that you suffer from, no regret, no lamentation. Inshallah, may Allah SWT make us among the people of paradise in this life and accept our deeds into the hereafter. Then the ayat will turn the tone to redirect us to some of the signs of Allah SWT through his creation. So ayah number 62, and we are still in surah number 39, surah Az-Zumar. He says, Allah is the creator of all things. Why does Allah keep asserting that he is the creator of all things? It is unfortunately because up until today, the number of people who deny Allah and claim that things popped up by chance, by coincidence, or evolved from one from another, are still the greater number amongst the human race. And that's why such ayat, such verses are spread throughout the Quran asserting that Allah is the creator of all things. Not only that, and he is 
the disposer of everything and he is the guardian over everything. He is the one that controls and manages everything, including us people, Muslims and disbelievers alike. We are all under his control. Furthermore, Ayah 63, it says, in his hands and to him belongs the keys of the heavens and the earth. Amazing, amazing. Imagine when, when Allah is telling us the keys of the heavens and the keys of the treasures and the earth, everything in them are in the hands of Allah. That shows how much power he has, how much control he has, and how those who disbelieve in Allah are sincerely the real losers. They need to submit to Allah. Who has such powers other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who has the power to turn the day into night and the night into the day? Who has the power to allow the sun to rise or to cover it completely and let us live in darkness? He shows us his power from time to time through the solar eclipse, the lunar eclipse, the change of the norms, turning the daylight into dark night, when black clouds cover the sky and we have no access to the sunlight or the sun heat even. Amazing power. Why is Allah displaying all of this power? It is to humble us. It is to make us resign and submit to his power and to his majesty. And number 64, raises a question. It tells the Prophet Muhammad, say, O Muhammad, meaning to the polytheists, the idol worshippers, the pagans, all the disbelievers, do you order me to worship anyone other than Allah? You fools, you ignorant people, you want me to worship your idols? Because the pagans sent a delegation to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said, Muhammad, you are inciting discord in the community. You are inciting children against parents, wives against husbands, and husbands against wives. You're breaking the fabric of our community. Let us come to an agreement, okay? Let us be logical with each other. So what do they suggest? They tell him, Muhammad, you worship our gods one day and we worship your God another day. This is very stupid. This is as ignorant as it can get. They don't appreciate Allah and they are negotiating with the messenger as to whom he should worship and they think with their false logic that when we divide the territory when we divide the godship and the worship and the submission between the two sets of gods that now the society can live in peace and we are fair to each other this logic is a false logic so they're inviting him to worship other than Allah. And Allah's telling him, tell them, do you want me to worship anyone other than Allah of your gods or any other gods? And then ayah number 65, it says, and certainly it has been revealed unto you, O Muhammad, as it was to those messengers before you, 
that if you join others in worship with Allah, then certainly Allah, all your deeds will be in vain with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will certainly be among the losers. Now, I want you to imagine with me, this is Allah talking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's telling him, the revelation we have given you is the same as the revelation we have given to those who came before you, messengers and prophets. What is the revelation? If you associate partners or gods with Allah, your deeds will be rendered useless in vain, and you will be counted among the losers. If this is true for the messenger of Allah, how more true is it for us, anyone else? So in Ayah 66, the clear instruction comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, nay, you must worship Allah only and none with him. And you must be among the grateful ones. Which means be grateful for the guidance Allah has given you. Be grateful that he showed you the straight path. Then reasoning and explanation in ayah number 67 about those who were inviting the prophet to worship other gods. It says, they have not made a just appreciation of Allah, which is due to him. And on the day of resurrection, the whole of the earth will be grasped by his hand and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand. Glorified is he and high is he above all that they associate as partners with him. Think of this again. I will repeat ayah number 67. Those people who are suggesting to the Prophet وسلم, and now they are suggesting to us, worship Jesus, for example, and you will be saved. The Quran is saying, they have not appreciated Allah as it is due to his majesty. How come when the earth and the heavens are rolled in his hand, praised and glorified is he above the partners they associate with him? This is a condemnation that no one could imagine a stronger language of condemnation. Then the ayat from 68 will move us into after the judgment on the day of judgment, the post judgment. But it will give us the beginning first of resurrection and then judgment. So in ayah number 68 it says and the trumpet will be blown and all who are in the heavens and all who are on the earth will soon uh, will swoon away. They will be sucked into death. And then a second time a second blow will come and behold they will be standing, looking on, and waiting. The ayah is talking about two blown breaths, if you will, or wind or something into the trumpet. The angel of death will blow one blow into the trumpet, and every living thing will die in the heavens and in the earth. Everything will die, except what Allah wills to outlive that blow. And then 
it will be blown a second time and everyone will be standing in awe and shock of the resurrection. What else will happen? This is giving us details of the day of judgment. Of course, the day of judgment will come while some people would be alive. But in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, he mentions that the hour will not come except on the worst of the worst. You see, the worst of the worst are the ones who would live through this horrifying moments that will take the hearts out of everybody's body. <clears throat> then what happens? And the sun uh, will shine on the earth, but more than the sun is the light of the Lord of the earth. So the earth will shine at that time, not by the light of the sun, but by the light of Allah, the creator of the sunlight. Imagine the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it, it is displayed on the entire earth. And the earth will be shining, it will be bright, white, and every book will be presented and the prophets will be brought and the witnesses will be called and the judgment will be rendered in truth and nobody will be wrong. Allah is giving us the plan, the program for the day of judgment which means he is telling us, beware, this is not a vague prospect. This is a clear day with certain action plan. There are steps that will happen and there are situations that you will have to prepare for. So the earth will be lit with Allah's light and the books will be presented and the prophets will be called and the witnesses will testify and there will be judgment amongst people in truth and they will not be wrong. What else? And number 70, and each soul will be paid back in full whatever it has done. And Allah knows best what they do. Ayah 71, and those who disbelieved will be ushered to hellfire in groups till when they reach it, the gates thereof will be opened suddenly like a prison at the arrival of the prisoners. And its guards will say, didn't the messengers come to you from yourselves? From yourselves means humans like you. Uh, and didn't those messengers come to you from yourself, reciting to you the verses of your Lord? and warning you of the meeting of this day of yours, then people will say, yes, but the word of torment has been justified against the disbelievers. They will then admit that they have received the messengers, they have received the message, but the word of Allah against the disbelievers has come to pass. They cannot escape. It will be done. Then it will be told at 72, it will be told to them 
enter you the gates of hell to abide therein. And indeed, what an evil abode for the arrogant. This is the worst fate for the arrogant ones, those who were mocking the faith and denying Allah his rights to be worshipped, to be obeyed, and to be submitted to. Okay, so in ayah number 71, those who have disbelieved will be ushered in droves into Jahannam, hellfire. Until they reach their off, the gates will open, which means the gates of hell are shut closed until each group that is ushered reaches the gates, the gates of hell will be opened literally. This is not metaphoric, this is real. And the guards will meet this wave of people of hell. They will be face to face with the guards and the guards of hellfire are harsh hearted they have no empathy, they have no mercy. And they will be frowning and stern. They will tell them, haven't you received your messengers that came from your own community, people that you knew, you grew up with, and they were reciting the verses of Allah unto you. And they were warning you your meeting of this day of yours. And the disbelievers would say, yes, indeed. But the word of torment has come to pass against the disbelievers. And then they will be told, enter into the gates of hellfire. You will be there for eternity. And this is the worst abode for the arrogant ones. As 73, and those who kept their duty to the Lord will be led to paradise in groups till when they reach it and its gates are ready open for them. It, it's open before their arrival. So before they reach the gates, they smell the good smells of paradise and the gates are open so they see the beautiful things that are waiting for them in paradise. It's amazing. And it's gods, the gods of paradise will say, peace be unto you. You have done well. So enter here to abide therein. Amazing welcome, amazing welcome. May Allah welcome us into paradise. See, what is the first statement they make as soon as they see this and start entering into paradise? The people of paradise will say, all praises and thanks belong to Allah who has fulfilled his promise to us and has made us inherit this land, the land of paradise. We can dwell in paradise wherever we will, wherever we want. How excellent a reward for the dutiful workers this is. So they will be so grateful and they will recognize the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is worthy of their praise, who has kept his promise, as he said to us in the revelation in this life, that those who will do good, those who believe and do good, they will end up in paradise. Then the ayah number 75, the following ayah, will describe for us the rest of the atmosphere, the rest of what's happening out there. So it says, 
and you will see the angels surrounding the throne of Allah from all around, from all angles, from all sides, glorifying the praises and chanting the praises of Allah. And they will, they and all creatures will be judged by the judgment of truth. Even the prophets will be judged. Have you not communicated my message? Mm -hmm. What response did you get from your community? How did people treat you? And the angels will be surrounding the throne of Allah. And the great word in this ayah, every word is great, but the great word in this ayah is where it says, and you will see the angels. You the believers who imagined how the angels look like, you made statues of angels, you made pictures of angels out of your own imagination. You will see them with your own eyes then. And you will be very pleased to do that. And the, the judgment of truth will happen amongst people. And then at the end, it will be said by everybody that all praise are, is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of all. Mankind, jinns, humans, uh, and all that exists. This is the end of Surah number 39. And as you see, the beautiful conclusion that was preceded by the horrifying description of the people of hellfire and hellfire and the accountability, the regrets, the judgment, and the fate that everybody would face, and the beautiful place that is awaiting for the believers and those who are dutiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sisters and brothers, this life is too short to waste any minute, to waste any resource, to waste your time, to waste your money, to waste your energy, to waste your family, to waste loved ones, do not waste anything because you will be asked about everything. Everything you have in this life is a gift. And these are the choices. And as you have seen by the end of this surah number 39, surah al zumar the fate of those who live a clean, beautiful life and those who lived a life of rebellion and disbelief. I would love to give you the next 15 minutes to ask any question, uh, if you have any question about Surah Az-Zumar or any ayah therein, or any other questions for that matter. Any question from anyone? If you have no question, we can move on. Okay, so let us move on to Surah number 40. Surah number 40 is Surah Ghafir. And Surah Ghafir uh, has the features of the Mecca surahs, which we have explained several times before. The Mecca surahs talk to us about mostly uh, 
previous stories of prophets with their communities. It talks about Tawheed. It talks about the Day of Judgment. It talks about the fate of the believers or disbelievers. It talks about the consistency of the message that we all call Islam, which is the only religion that Allah recognizes because it is the only religion he sent down to mankind. So Surah Ghafir, which is Surah number 40, starts off with two letters uh, in the name of Allah, ha -mim. And we mentioned before that those letters from the Arabic language that are put in the beginning of certain surahs, they are miraculous signs from Allah with which he challenges the Arab laureates and poets and uh, you know linguists of the Arab culture to bring something like the Quran if they can. And whenever any surah is starting with this, the following ayah or ayat will be always referring to the book. So ayah number two immediately says, the revelation of this book, which is also referred to as the book and also referred to as the Quran, is from Allah, the Almighty and the All-Knower. So as you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ties between the book and its revelation and the one who revealed it. If it is coming from the Almighty, the All-Knower, then it must carry part of his might and part of his knowledge that he wants to show us. Whatever he wants to share with us, he is sharing it in the Quran or by inspiration to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Prophet would share it with us in the form of his speech, his hadith. Then it goes on to define Allah in ayah number three. It says, the forgiver of sin, which is Allah, the accepting of repentance, the one who accepts our repentance. And the one who is severe in punishment, Allah is not someone that you take lightly. With this description, his word is, is part of his might and it cuts through everything and it is going to come to pass against anyone who violates it, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says here that he is the one who accepts repentance. He is the one who is swift and severe in punishment. And he is the one that bestows all favors upon the whole world. All bounties are his. All creations are his. So he puts from his bounties down and about for anyone, anywhere, and the choice is all his. The decision is all his. And he does what he wills and nobody could force his hand. He has the power to do anything without being questioned or stopped. And then it says, there is no God but he, and to him is the final return. To him is the final return. Why is this extensive introduction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is because we will see in the stories in this surah 
and elsewhere in the Quran that those qualities that Allah is displaying here are central in our belief system. So when Allah introduced himself as the forgiver of sin, the acceptor of repentance, this is a huge enticement for us to hasten and return back to Allah in repentance and take responsibility for what we have done and ask for his forgiveness. And when he introduces himself as very severe in punishment, it is to warn those who are daring his power, who are challenging his authority or challenging his message. You cannot dare do that. And then he concludes by saying, there is no God but he, and you will return to no one but him. So this is a full circle display, not only of the power of Allah, the powers of Allah, but it is also to wrap our head with his power so that we lower our head to the floor in appreciation of his majesty and in submission to his will. Don't trace your head in arrogance in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, uh, some people, unfortunately, when they stand for prayer, they raise their heads up. And the Prophet وسلم, prohibited us from doing that. Your head should be lowered in front of Allah. Your eyes should be focused on the spot of your sujood, your prostration. You should not turn your eyes around or your heads around, nor should you wander even with your thoughts. You should be fully focused. Why? You are standing before the one who forgives the sins, the one who accepts repentance, the one who is swift and severe in punishment, the one who has power that no one can take away, and he is the only God, and you are in the process of returning to him. This is amazing. So, with this introduction, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves us to the second ayah, where he says, that no one disputes or argues about the evidence, the proofs, the verses, the lessons, the signs, the miracles, the revelation of Allah, but those who disbelieve. Those are the ones who argue with Allah. So do not be deluded by their ability to roam the earth. Don't be deluded by this, don't be deceived, okay? Because their ultimate, their ultimate fate is gonna be in hellfire. So why should we be deluded by the show of power in the land by the tyrants, the despots, and the aggressive ones, and the wrongdoers, and the corrupting elements of humans. Why should we be deceived by their display of their limited power? Com you, you can't even compare this with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, just leave them to enjoy themselves here. So it says, before them, before them, the people of Noah have belied the message and the parties that came after them, the confederates that came after them also belied their messengers. And each one of them 
each one of those nations, they plotted against their messenger to seize him and to disrupt his message. And they argued and disputed by means of falsehood to refute the message and the truth. Then Allah says, so I seized them with punishment and how terrible was my punishment. Ayah number six, and this is how the word of Allah has come to pass against the disbelievers that indeed they will be the companions of the fire. I think I will stop here to move to my next class. And uh, we will be going, inshallah, from ayah number seven, surah number 40, inshallah. I will ask you excuse. I have to go to my next class in two minutes. Inshallah, I'm sorry, I didn't give a chance for questions today. Please remind me somebody next time to leave time for questions. And if you missed the opportunity to make your question now, uh, please write it down and present it next time, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته